So welcome to this fifth episode of our conversations with Dr Shilpa McQuillan. This is part of our six part gift before Christmas um, and these are going down so so well. Uh, people are really pleased that we've done this series and um, this is an episode that's particularly close to my heart. Um, if you follow me on my YouTube channel you'll see there's an episode there with my lovely sister Kishani talking about endometriosis and in fact she's the, she's the person that actually is responsible in part for me meeting brilliant Dr Shilpa. So hi Shilpa, how are you? Thank you, good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. So we're going to talk about the topic of endometriosis um, and maybe you've never heard of endometriosis, maybe you do know someone who's got endometriosis. So I I know that we've got exactly the right person here because as we know Shilpa is a gynaecologist and a menopause specialist GP. So she's just exactly the person that should be enlightening us spotlighting what we need to know about endometriosis either because we have it or because we just need to be aware of it so Shilpa tell us what is endometriosis so we have a womb in our womb we have the lining of the womb the lining of the womb is called the endometrium so what happens every month is that womb lining sheds it's inflamed first thickens and sheds endometriosis is, is when you can have similar tissue like that womb lining in other parts of the body. The most common place we can get them, Amantha, is typically in the pelvis, so other layers of the womb, and people might have heard of something called adenomyosis, so that is when you have endometriosis-like tissue in the other layers of the womb. You may have it in your ovaries, you may have it in your fallopian tube, so that tends to be the most common areas to get it also be in other areas more distant so places like the vagina the bladder and the bladder tract the urinary tract places like the bowel and then really really rarely these little deposits can spread to other parts of the body like the lung I mean that's quite shocking isn't it but you know that's very rare but it can happen it can uh, present in distant organs Wow. And so that makes so much sense. So my sister, who is totally fine with me talking about her, her situation, I mean, she was undiagnosed for years and I can't tell you the amount of terrible advice she got. Um, she's in her 50s now. Um, but, you know, things like take the contraceptive pill forever, take it for three months, then have a break. She was even advised to get pregnant because that might sort it out. I mean, utterly ridiculous but those are the sorts of things historically that that women were being told to do um but the reality is it is migrating tissue i mean there is some research looking at things like um xenoestrogens things that come from plastics i mean do we know and and my sister actually ended up having so much endometriosis wrapped in her bowel it was strangulating parts of her bowel and she actually had to have that removed and resected so rejoined together so um do we know specifically what causes, you know, the tissues to migrate, Shilpa? Do, is, is there an, et, you know, etiology behind that? Do we understand that? Well, I think we do, and, it's really, and I think that's one of the reasons why this is so tricky to diagnose, because it's not necessarily something that happens in, you know, your family members. It's not necessarily genetics. It's not ethnicity. Nothing like that links there. Um, it's it's one of those really tricky things. And, and one of the other reasons it's so difficult to diagnose is it's such a spectrum. It affects people so differently to the point where it's graded endometriosis and you could have severe endometriosis and still not have symptoms, but yet you could have really mild endometriosis and get severe symptoms. So what's so, the grading, Shilpa? So, so mild, moderate, severe. And the way that it presents doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get symptoms, but also doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get found. And we'll talk about the different ways that it's investigated as well. Um, but you're mentioning about your sister and the amount of the, uh, you know, the type of way it presented. So, you know, why does it present in such different ways? So we've got this, this tissue lining, haven't we? So it's shedding every month, your normal bleed, your womb line is thickened, then it sheds. And what happens to our period though? Normally we have an outlet, don't we? It goes through your cervix, it goes to your vagina. So when endometriosis first starts, what happens is these other deposits that present in the body, they will also inflame and shed. And so that's why when 
some people, it's very subjective pain, isn't it? Some people don't even get period pains. So that's why for years you might get people who don't even experience pain. But for some people, they may get it that it's starting with just every month during their cycle, they're getting heavy bleeding and they're getting pain in other areas of the body. But why then does it develop to, like you say, like your, your poor sister where these things happened, is that because our womb lining can shed and, and the blood goes out the body, these other deposits, if they're presenting, for example, in our pelvis, there's nowhere for that blood to go, is there? And so what's happening in blood over time causes inflammation. Inflammation causes scar tissue. So a lot of women will go from having that just heavy periods, painful periods, to then eventually getting pain in the pelvis all the time. Wow. So you can see just by what we're saying, the symptoms are very different for everyone. The pain threshold is very different for everyone. Pain doesn't necessarily correlate with the severity. And if someone presents with chronic pelvic pain, they get told, well, you're not getting the monthly pain. So it can't be something like that. But in fact, it can develop into that because the eventual pathology that ends up with it being scar tissue that then, of course, scar tissue is permanent. That doesn't rely on your monthly cycle. That is something that just develops inflammation and scar tissue in the body. And that's why it's such a myriad of symptoms. It's so varied for a lot of people. And like you've just been describing for your sister, for some people, absolutely horrific consequences. Oh my God, massive. I mean, my sister was never not able to have children, um, you know, and really, I mean, sounds to me like in an ideal world, I know the NHS is stretched, etc. But how could we diagnose that earlier? Would it be a scan? Would it be some sort of, sort of other investigation? Sure. But in an ideal world, how would we know sooner what it is we're dealing with? What would you yeah. say? I'm going to be really honest with you because of how varied it is. And remember, having been a gynecologist, I've been I've done laparoscopy. So the, the gold standard is a laparoscopy. For those of you who don't know, laparoscopy is a keyhole surgery. So it's a little camera, thin cameras. There's a couple of ports that go through your tummy. And then you put the camera in and then that's how you have a good look around rather than a long incision either, you know, um, around where your uh, bikini lining is or up and down your belly button. That's the traditional ways to do surgery. We're getting more and more laparoscopic surgery, which is keyhole to try and minimize um, not only complications after surgery, but minimize scars. Now, that's the gold standard. Why? Because you're taking a direct look in the pelvis. But I just said to you about the different grading. The problem with the grading is that you can get what we call deep deposits deep in your pelvis, but you can miss them. So that in fact, the deeper the, the deposits, the most severe ones, you can even get missed by laparoscopy because they're really deep into the tissues and you can't see them. So laparoscopy is gold standard because you can see scar tissue. You can see fluid. You can see cysts. So we get what we call chocolate cysts, endometriomas. So they're, they're ovarian cysts that look, they're brown because they've got blood filled tissue in them. So you can see all these things at, a lapros uh, at laparoscopy. So that's why it's something that's the gold standard because when you're looking at somebody, if I'm doing a consultation with you, I can't see that, can I? If you do an ultrasound, that's good because it can pick up cysts, it can pick up fluid, it can put up something we call a sliding scale. And again, I'm telling this for patients because they may have looked at their ultrasound report or been read to them. And it says like they've got a fixed pelvis or a negative or a positive sliding scale. What that means is, when they've put the probe in, so this is a vaginal ultrasound, you go through the vagina to do the scan. What it means is when you move their uterus up and down, it doesn't move. And that's a sign of scar tissue. And that is often associated with endometriosis. The other thing you can see on a scan is fuzzy looking area. So that's where adenomyosis might be seen. So within the layers of the uterus, it just looks a bit odd. It's different colors. It's bits are white, bits are black like they should be. And it's got a, that mixed echogenicity. And so those are the things that get picked up on the scan. Ultimately, a laparoscopy, you can see all those other things. You can see the blood in the uterus. You can see um, the scar tissue. You can see the, the fluid. You can see the cyst. But as I've said to you, I've been to lots of laparoscopies. I've done lots of laparoscopies where the pelvis looks fine. But yet these people have symptoms that are so suggestive of endometriosis. So to answer your question, it's not necessarily absolutely diagnosis should be there. You should be referred to early on because of the consequences like chronic pelvic pain that 
for a lot of people cannot be reversed or the fertility implications. But actually, it's getting the diagnosis right so that at least we can treat it. And so for some people, their family may have been completed. And it's reasonable, and we'll go through the treatments, but it's reasonable to try treatment because then it's controlling their symptoms. For some people, they're starting to get these symptoms early. They're not getting pregnant within a year, but yet they've got symptoms very suggestive. You want to be going to see that specialist so that that can be investigated. And if laparoscopy is negative, it's on the system, isn't it? It's being referred to the right people so that we're not leaving it, that we're not getting pregnant two, three years down the line, by which time scar tissue may then develop, you know, then it becomes too late. And, and can you just explain to us how the scar tissue can affect fertility? Yeah, so it's like anything in the pelvis. You know, we talk about scar tissues with, you know, people who've had infections, mm. um, people have had endometriosis, because it basically, scar a couple of things, scar tissues around um, the ovary or cysts around the ovaries, it means there's no room for those eggs to be, no room for those eggs to release, firstly. Scar tissue influences when that egg meets that sperm, where is it meeting it? Where is it getting stuck? Because yeah. that can lead to things like ectopic pregnancy yes. as well. Is that egg even reaching the fallopian tube to meet that sperm? Yeah. Scar tissue can really influence that. We know inflammation itself. You know, how many times do we hear doctors say, just try and relax to get pregnant? Well, we know infl inflammatory response. You know this, Amanda, you're, you're a med... Um, um, your pharmacy trained what does inflammation response do to our body so again you're getting a lots of inflammation aren't you in your body when you're having endometriosis so of course there's that influence and of course let's not forget the stress of worrying about it the implications as well as the symptoms I mean you've mentioned sorry I know we've said your sister but that is some real you know involvement of bowel these are real symptoms that get often because if you think about it having bowel and urinary symptoms how many people present with IBS Yes. In, you know, irritable bowel syndrome where they're, or an irritable bladder where they get kept thinking it's it's bladder infections. Well, my sister was so bad, Shilpa, it ended up in an obstruction. Yeah. An emergency situation. Yeah. Because no one was listening to her. And sort of, you know, gaslighting her, saying she's like worried well and all of these things. Seems to run in our family. That's, you know, that's exactly the same approach I was subjected to. And and the, and, and I just want to come back to people. I mean, you're so helpful, Shilpa, honestly. It's just brilliant. I've learned stuff there in just what you say, you've you said. Um, is that actually, you know your body, don't you? I want to really encourage you. Really, you know your body. The biggest challenge is getting people to listen to you. But actually, you stay resolute. If it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel right. Um, so, you know, get other people recruited to help champion and support you because actually there are amazing people like Dr. Shilpa. In fact, you don't have to fight too hard. I would say get in touch with someone like Shilpa. I, I wish you'd, I wished you'd been around when my sister was going through it, Shilpa. Um, I really do. And I think there are thousands, tens of thousands of women who could benefit from your compassionate insightful knowledgeable approach to this topic so so we're about symptom diaries i'm a real believer in taking that you know showing people what are the symptoms you're getting yes. you know what's happening to you yes. and a lot of misdiagnosis does happen because of how varied it is like your sister the bowel like people don't think of that that you can get really awful bowel symptoms yeah. um you know some of the bowel symptoms are blood in the stools right some of the symptoms are what we call proctalgia, that is spasms. I don't know if people listening to this will can relate to this. One of the most common symptoms you can get is proctalgia. You get spasms in your bottom. It feels like, honestly, someone's put a hot rod up there, apparently. And particularly during your period, that can happen. Because if those deposits, can you imagine, they're around your bowel, they're around your oh anal tissue? God. Imagine the spasms you and get. And the amount of nerve tissue one... there. Yeah. And so that's another way that bowel um, uh, presents. What about pelvis? You wouldn't believe how many women I've seen over the years, even as a gynecologist in hospital, I'm getting this really odd pain going down my legs. Mm. They're getting told, well, it's got nothing to do with the, the gynecological system. But it is like, it's one of the most common symptoms to get that pain running down your legs. It's all interconnected. Yeah. And I know my sister, again, wouldn't mind saying that actually she often, and this I know is an also another symptom, but because of stigma and taboo, people don't talk about it. She often felt she hadn't fully evacuated her bowel. Yeah. 
you know so it's, it's that sensation of I haven't finished and actually because the nerves were so damaged sometimes she couldn't tell if she had finished or not um, and so that I mean these are psychologically damaging elements for people to have to navigate aren't they as you know we already know that women are leaving work in their droves you know you can imagine now add that into perimenopause you've got endometriosis perimenopause I mean our last episode is going to be about PMDD and premenstrual um, syndrome but this is like the perfect storm isn't it absolutely you know, I want to say because I think it's really important to see somebody who knows what their you know, able, you know, the speciality it is and how important it is to women, because you can understand a lot of women feel frightened and they think, well, I'm worried about my fertility. I'm wondering, I want a laparoscopy. Mm. So one thing I also, when I do my counselling, it's about including that patient in this counselling firstly and talking to them about what could be involved. But one thing I'm also very clear is don't forget the implications of surgery and what that can do. So why I mentioned to you that, you know, everyone is so individualized. Imagine if you've had completed your family and you're getting these symptoms. I mentioned earlier, didn't I, this reasonable to start treatments rather than going down a laparoscopy route. But that's because surgery in itself can cause scar tissue. Yes. Imagine if you've already got scar tissue and you're having multiple laparoscopies after laparoscopy, worsening that scar tissue. Imagine if you're someone, like we've been discussing, where you've got adhesions all around your bowels, scar tissue all around your bladder, and you put in, because the first port you put in when you do it is blind, remember? Yeah. After that, you can see because you've got a camera in there to do the next ports. Yeah. Imagine if you've got scar tissue and your bowel sitting up here with scar tissue. You've just got to be very careful. And that's why I think it's so important to go to the right person. So go to a specialist. Go to, you know, if things aren't settled despite basic treatments, then being referred to an endometriosis centre. Because it's very important that patients are counselled about these things that can worsen symptoms but also have risks in themselves, especially if you've got severe endometriosis, there's risk of perforating, making a hole in your bladder and your bowel, you know, and that then in itself worsens symptoms as well. So it's really important that everybody has all the information when they make that. Decision. So true. The informed patient is the informed patient, isn't it? That gives you confidence, um, assurance. I mean, nothing's 100% guaranteed, but, you know, how often do we hear, Shilpa, in our daily work, people saying, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've had a hysterectomy and I didn't I wasn't counseled or coached into knowing that I would be straight into surgical menopause it's so important we're pro-choice aren't we Shilpa you know we are both very pro-choice and so actually what helps you make choice is having all the knowledge and the awareness and that information really isn't it yeah and you know I really think what helps me is being a GP as well as having been a hospital gynecologist and a community gynecologist now I hope patients find I give that all rounded approach because I know how pressurized GP is, but I know the implications of surgery. And so I do think it's important. We're also realistic and give patients time to understand this, but that they are aware of all the risks and the consequences and implications that everything holds. Yeah, I absolutely love that. So we've talked about look, quite a few things there. So we know that how does it present? why it's important to get it right we know about the long-term consequences about the scarring and that's really I've learned quite a lot there today about that I know my sister will definitely be watching this um and I'd just like to say big shout out to University College London um hospital which is where my sister had her pioneering surgery um her surgeon won an award for her surgery because it was life-changing for her it was absolutely brilliant but I do want to just talk a little bit about the treatments uh non-hormonal hormonal and I also want to bring into this little bit segue, if that's OK, Shilpa, let's talk about people who have had surgery, who maybe are now in perimenopause, postmenopause, you know, and I want to talk about progesterone specifically, and you know why I want to do that. But let's talk about those treatments, shall we? Hormonal, non-hormonal. What can you tell us? I, I do, as you know, Amantha, it's about going through the category. So let's start with what can you do for yourself? What can you do to empower yourself? We've talked about how endometriosis is inflammatory yeah so trying to eat low inflammatory foods you know that can trigger um endometriosis is is, is really important um and it's quite simple now that you can you know pretty much glue a, a google low inflammatory foods and and what we mean by that is just trying to not stress the body so that can can and i'm a big believer in everything in moderation but just being aware of things that can worsen it so things like caffeine things yeah. like alcohol things like smoking these can all um you know uh, worsen um, trigger endometriosis 
let's not forget, you know, we've talked about the implication on your bladder and bowels. How can we help our bowels work better? Mm -hmm. You know, not being sluggish, not being constipated. This can, of course, increase inflammation as well as making us feel, um, you know, pretty awful in ourselves. But trying to get that bowel movement when it, when it already doesn't. So trying to avoid foods that keep us constipated, drinking plenty of fluids, um, you know, clear fluids, waters, uh, water and things like that. That's, that's one aspect. So lifestyle. Um, but we can do. Then there are meditative um, therapies. So sorry, I, I forgot to say about the... Um, inflammatory foods are things like yeasts and dairy mm -hmm. they're the things that I mean so things that contain high uh, yeast and uh, dairy tend to tend to be the things that do that yeah. um and then what can we do to reduce our stress so mm -hmm. there are you know meditative um function really helps you know breathing exercises that can really help us and alongside this this is not what I'm saying is going to suddenly reduce your endometriosis I'm just trying to say things to improve quality of life here you know things like cognitive behavioral therapy these are all things that can just try and give us a meditative lower stress state of our body when it's already in quite a high high stress um um trigger um, that's one thing could I add, could I just add something in? Could I just add something in? Only because I've been following um, Dr. Jacqueline Bowden, and this is something for myself. We do have estrogen dominance in our family. So, of course, that endometrial tissue is going to be much more reactive to higher levels of circulating estrogen. And so being able to detox your estrogen is equally important. So we do know things like broccoli sprouts are amazing. Um, DIM, which is um, like a cofactor, which is important for helping detox estrogen. So it, it's all of those these things, isn't it? But like you say, the functioning of the bowel, which is where most of our detoxification of estrogen does take place through, through that estrobolome. I always struggle with that word, estrobolome. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, so those things are also important too, aren't they? If, if we do have naturally high levels of circulating estrogen Absolutely. To yeah exactly so you've got the help with inflammation you've got the bit to treat the endometriosis for example scar tissue so this is where things like doing a um what we call a treatment laparoscopy is helpful so removing that scar tissue removing those um fists because obviously some people do get their symptoms from having very large twi twists um sorry <laughs> twister on a monday very large cysts or the risk of a twisting cyst. You've got to worry about those things. So you might want to reduce um, endometriosis uh, in terms of scar tissue, in terms of cysts. And don't forget those trying to get pregnant as well. Yeah. You can have what we call laparoscopy and dye. So checking the function of the tube, seeing if there's anything obstructing that. Is there scar tissue obstructing that? Is there um, ovarian cysts that are pushing uh, against the ovary? So again, you want to get rid of those things if that is going to help with um pregnancy so that's another aspect so you've got treating inflammation treating the disease itself trying to get rid of the actual deposits and then you've got reducing estrogen that's the third one so why is that because when we're menstruating it's a change in our hormones your ink your lining thickens with the with progesterone and somewhat estrogen and then your lining sheds doesn't it yeah. so the treatments for the hormone aspects are aimed at trying to control that so you've got simple things like you're saying, reducing by using um, herbal and alternatives. You have got things like the pill, because what that does is it stabilizes the hormone. We're just trying to stabilize it. But what I recommend to patients is taking it back to back. Because when you then get that bleed, you're going to get that horrible symptoms and you're going to get really painful periods, and you're going to get a lot of bleeding, aren't you? Heavy yes. menstrual bleeding. So trying to take the, the, the contraceptive pill back to back can help with that. Yes. What other things can help? Things like the marina coil. Because again, you're reducing the ovulation, you're reducing the flow. A lot of people will use it to treat pelvic pain and we use it to treat heavy periods. So again, that's trying to help symptom relief. It's trying to reduce ovulation. So you're doing, so the pill, things like the hormonal coil. And then you've got things like something called um, gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Yes. So what you're doing, you're trying to switch off your ovaries and it's, it's nicely, hopefully, to the point about menopause, because we want to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. But what that does is it switches off your ovaries. So it's a non-surgical way. Some people use it prior to surgery to try and shrink endometriosis, things like trying to shrink fibroids, yeah. because they're all influenced by hormones. So what it does is it tries to reduce that. So some people use it as a diagnosis. So some surgeons will say, let's try it. If it works, it could be a good starter for us to look to then do surgery, maybe to do a hysterectomy. Some people get on really well with it. But then if you use it for more than six months, it has implications on bones, 
uh, glucose. So then you do have to make sure that you have, if you're using it for more than two years, you have a DEXA scan. Nice. And also you use HRT because it's sending you into menopause, firstly. But also nice. we know Amanda, from our lots of podcasts we've done that menopause, especially early menopause, can lead to um, risk of osteoporosis. Nice. So you need to be having that replaced. So traditionally, it's, 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 that was a great thing that gynecologists used. But actually HRT, we know, you know, a lot of women can take it, try, you know, um, there's lots of options for that. And that's that's a, um, another type of treatment. And then, of course, you've got surgery, like you've mentioned, of what's the most um, permanent way of reducing ovulation, taking out your ovaries and, and your womb. OK, so let's put, so that's brilliant. Again, it's all about that informed choice. But let's talk about what happens. OK, so you have your surgery, um, you're going through perimenopause, the hormones are declining at a certain rate. We know that progesterone is the first one to decline most rapidly. So that's the one that's actually protecting you against that endometrial reactivation, isn't it? So any tissues that might be left because, you know, surgeons can only do so much we don't know exactly where all these little tissues might be lying we don't know exactly where we can get them my sister has a lot in her in her back I mean the fact that you've said they can even appear in your lungs I mean it just sounds absolutely awful um and so we've got our BMS book here ready and waiting because it's all highlighted up but actually we want to sort of give an important message to people which is so what happens, like my sister, and we know what's happened because she's under the great care at University College London Hospital, but what happens after surgery to make sure we don't get those ongoing symptoms or we can certainly reduce them? What happens and how does progesterone come into that? About why you're having surgery in the first place, often it's because of debilitating symptoms, so you want to switch your ovaries off. But also, people have such extensive amount in their pelvis, so be it in the other layers of the womb, causing severe pain, severe flooding in their periods and severe pelvic pain permanently, not just during their periods. You're getting scar tissue, you're getting cysts constantly on your ovaries. And so you might have this taken out. Now, by definition, I've just said to you that it can extend into your pelvis and um, you um, into your um, uh, pelvis, sorry, into the rest of the uh, layers of the uterus and your pelvis. But I've also said at the beginning, how you can have deep endometriosis and not know it's there. So if you pull this scar tissue in your pelvis, but you might even have some deposits, how do we know we've got rid of all of it? We don't. And so when we are, for example, going through perimenopause, the first thing I would say is a lot of women say to me, this is brilliant. My endometriosis is going to be gone because you've told me when I go through menopause, it will be gone. Absolutely. The problem is most women in the population may suffer from menopause symptoms. The other thing is, we may take your ovaries out, which induces a menopause as well. So how are we going to treat those menopause symptoms? Most, a lot of women, sorry, not most women, benefit from HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Now, 5% of all of endometriosis is triggered by estrogen. If we give estrogen, what's that going to do to people? It's going to flare up your symptoms. You're going to get pelvic pain again. It's going to worsen. But there's also a safety issue here, Amantha. If we haven't got rid of all of your womb lining, and when you are going through menopause, we tell women, we can't just give you estrogen if you've got a womb, we have to give you progestogens. Because if you took estrogen alone, it thickens your womb lining and puts you at risk of womb cancer. And if I'm saying endometriosis is deposits of that womb lining other area of the body, and we haven't got it all, what can that potentially do? It's got the potential for what we call malignant transformation. So it's got the potential for those that have been left behind that are um, our um, womb lining deposits, you give someone oestrogen, it's got the percent potential, not rarely, but there have been cases potential that turn to turn malignant into okay. endometrial cancer. Right. And that's the bit that we need people also to be aware of, because I honestly can tell you on a weekly basis, Shilpa, people don't know that in that detail. And I think that's the bit that we want. And so um, remember, 
amazing Dr. Sai Shulpa are few and far between because she's got that dual specialism of being a gynecologist and a menopause specialist. So we're largely relying on GPs who, in fairness to them, probably don't have the same breadth and depth of knowledge as Shilpa. Um, but what they do have is documents like this to refer to, which is menopause. It's the management of menopause written by the British Menopause Society. And this is updated. But actually, it does say on page 143 that in women with severe endometriosis, where there has been extensive or residual disease at the time of surgery, surgery, continuous combined oestrogen and progesterone replacement or tibolone is favoured by many gynaecologists to minimise the risks of reactivation or residual disease, exactly as Shilpa has said. So that bit of information is on your side and it's worth knowing about that. So you can get that off of the British Menopause uh, Society website or in fact ask your GP to look it up because th yeah. that is, that's informing them too. I also want to say something else some people might not know. When you have hysterectomy, if you've got lots of scar tissue, we're not guaranteed if you were told that we're going to take your womb and your cervix out. If you've got lots of scar tissue, you can't guarantee that all of your cervix has been removed and that there may not be deposits on your cervix. So what I do for these women in this case, is then what we call a progesterone challenge. You give three months of progesterone. So let's say you have extensive endometriosis but we know they've endometriosis or other conditions of which their cervix has been taken out. Hmm. I will give what we call progesterone challenge. You give progesterone three months, you stop it. And if they get a withdrawal bleed, because remember they've got their cervix and their vagina, so there's somewhere for the blood to come out. That's a sign they still need to continue progesterone for the rest of their time Amazing. using HRT. Amazing. And so, so coming back, so that's brilliant. So have we covered everything around treatments, potentially about the non-hormonal hormonal treatments? Brilliant. We're on the home stretch then. So the question I suppose to ask if, ask you, Shilpa, is in an ideal world, should everyone be offered a laparoscopy for investigation? So I hope from listening to me, everyone's getting this kind of overall, not counselling, but informed understanding of it and so I don't think everybody needs laparoscopy and obviously I speak to many patients doing community gynecology and I will counsel them that where are you sitting with your family have you completed your family have you been trying to get pregnant and you haven't got pregnant in which case I think absolutely referral getting the diagnosis correct is important but with laparoscopy comes risks comes scar tissue so don't forget we don't want to increase scar tissue if someone's trying to get pregnant either so I will say to patients, there's two types of patients. You want symptom relief and you want to prevent worse, worrying things like not being able to get pregnant. With symptoms, I will always say, look, this is the, the thing. Yes, you might have a laparoscopy, but be warned, it doesn't diagnose it in everybody. But you've got symptoms to me that are very clearly this. Let's try all these hormonal and non-hormonal and lifestyle changes. And if that works, that's fine. You don't need a laparoscopy. Where people need laparoscopy is despite trying all of that, they're still getting extensive pain and things aren't getting better. It's not then, okay, we'll go away, that's the end. That needs to be looked at. That needs to go to um, be investigated. And if there's extensive endometriosis, there are very good endometriosis centres in this country. Like you said, UCH, we've got some in Oxford. These are dedicated centres with a multidisciplinary team that can deal with this and counsel you whether or not laparoscopy is appropriate. And people for fertile issues, absolutely need to get that sorted straight away and what I would say is get the ball rolling in terms of investigations it might be that you don't need to have a laparoscopy and people you know majority of people with endometriosis do get pregnant but where it's important is what happens if you've got extensive adhesions extensive ovarian cysts stopping you from being able to uh, reproduce then absolutely that needs to be done sooner than later and as I said to you there's something called a laparoscopy and dye where you have tests to mm. diagnose are your tubes patent are the sperm and egg going to me? And if they do, is it likely they're going to end up in the right places? So absolutely, laparoscopy should be reserved for these because there are risks to it as well. But having that informed time to talk about that and, and discuss is, is the key here. Not necessarily the laparoscopy, it's knowing about what your options are and actually what would actually benefit you individually. Absolutely. So uh, I know if I was sitting watching this, I'd be like, oh, my God, right. I need to write down where is this amazing doctor? So Dr. Shilpa McQuillan is um, based in Berkshire and uh, we always put her details in the show notes. So Shilpa, that has been so brilliant. Um, that in itself has been like a 101 about endometriosis. I've learned so much from you, as always. So um, thank you so much for your time. We'll put all your details in there. Is there if you were to give one bit of advice? to someone who's maybe thinking I don't know that could be me 
because my periods are all a bit funny. Um, you know, what one bit of advice would you start to say to someone who might be thinking, oh, I think this could be me? Yeah. Sleep in the diary and get help. Now, some of my colleagues may be sitting here going, oh, gosh, she's just told everyone to go to their GP. And I'm not saying that. But at the same time, we've got to be really mindful as professionals that this can have huge implication on people, fertility implications, you know. And actually, we worry about 10 minute appointments and what time it takes. But actually, it costs the NHS and takes a lot more time of having to deal with chronic pelvic pain that just doesn't get sorted. So we've got to think of it in a different light. I you love know, that. We've got really, to be really helping. good point. Can yeah. I just also say, because we did, we, we, we've done an episode on ethnicity, and as we know, Shilpa, your perimenopause can show up a lot earlier for you. So, you know, if you're getting heavy bleeding, you know, if you're getting lots of clots in your cycle, if your cycle's getting earlier, shorter, you know, we know that window to start your family is probably narrowing, particularly if you're of Asian or black heritage. Um, so it's so, so important, isn't it? Not to not to sit for too long. And actually, I think great advice all round, because actually, you know, it's not for the patient to make sense of it all. It's actually for specialists who's as brilliant as you, Shilpa, um, to be able to sit and go, listen, I think it, we could be going this way in two potential journeys but actually if we do some investigation we're more likely to find out exactly where you are so I think that is brilliant brilliant advice so for now Shilpa Dr Shilpa McQuillan yet another brilliant double appointment that you gave me there um I'm going to go away and tell all my friends about endometriosis what it is and what it isn't but for now Shilpa thank you so much for your time nice to see you and you